Hi, and welcome to Mid-Ohio Apologetics. We're going to be starting this podcast about Catholic faith and apologetics. I be, I'll be your host, Daniel Markham. This is your co-host, Bradley Tarr. Say hi, Brad. Good to see you, Dan. How are you doing today? It's awesome. I'm really looking forward to this. It's going to be our first podcast together, so I uh, hope it works out well. Awesome. So we're going to start out with some uh, religious news stories, right? Yeah, in the news this week... We've got the uh, hurricane, the Hurricane Harvey that hit hard in Texas. Uh, What do you think about that, Brad? Well, there's a lot of people, as always, some of them self-proclaimed preachers that kind of pick up a Bible and say, oh, there have been plagues in the past, so God must be angry at Texas. Right, right, because Texas is known to be that haven of liberals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you not only have uh, the, the central right and the far right, in Texas of Protestants, but as Cath- uh, with a lot of Catholics and Orthodox as well. Yeah, it's. Uh, I wonder, though, it does bring up a good point. In, in Scripture, sometimes natural disasters, or seemingly natural disasters, are actually warnings of things that are against people who are uh, doing wickedness. Yeah, um, so there have been many times, like with the sin of Achan and Joshua, where the whole nation of Israel was punished, and mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. when just Aaron and Moses, the leaders, sinned, and there were plagues that started... But we also have to remember that, you know, God said that he would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah if there were but ten righteous men. Right. God's not being unfair here. He is actually very merciful with us. So, what, I'm, I mean, it's, Dan, it's like making the argument that, like, oh, you know, 20 feet of snow fell in Russia. God must be angry at, you know, Patriarch Kirill. Yeah, but, you know, maybe one of the reasons why there's a lot of hurricanes in, like, Texas and Florida and Louisiana, places that are on the Gulf of Mexico, maybe it's because they're on the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, maybe it's because they're in Hurricane Alley. It's like, it's like saying, oh, I live in Kansas. God must be angry because I'm in Tornado Alley. <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe I shouldn't live here. That's the thing God's angry with. Like, you stupid you know, idiot. If, if you live where, where, if you live right next to a very active volcano. Don't be surprised don't, if you get lava. Don't be su- yeah, don't be surprised if you get suffocated by ash. And this doesn't mean that we're saying that the people that live there aren't intelligent and they're not good people. Except we're, the we're, ones who stayed. We're, they we're, might be. Well, I mean, <laughs> but well, we're, we're, we, we pray for all people and we're, we're trying to encourage the relief efforts. And actually, um, also in the news, the president and the vice president of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops have put out word to all the bishops of the of all of North America to gather special donations. So not uh, for the next few months, several months for for relief efforts. So there you go. It's not we're we're being very caring I mean, about people. That, and speaking of that's a, that's about fifteen to twenty million active Catholics that are going to be donating money to relief efforts. And speaking of the environment. Another piece of religious news that's been uh, going around lately has to do with the environment. I believe there was a joint declaration between Pope Francis and Patriarch Bartholomew. Yeah, Patriarch Bartholomew is, uh, we probably shouldn't say head, but he, he, he preside, they say he holds the presidency of love or charity in uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church. They also call themselves the canonical Orthodox because there's other dissident Eastern churches too mm-hmm, that are mm-hmm. different communions like the Coptic Orthodox, the Ethiopian Orthodox. So Eastern Orthodox often call themselves canonical Orthodox. And these are the good, uh, a good example of working together is creating a joint declaration about the environment, something that there's a lot of things that Catholics and Orthodox don't agree on yet, but we do agree. Like other forms of stewardship, for example. <laughs> like the Pope, sh- for example. should the Pope yeah. have a uh, primacy of Jurisdiction. But we do agree about stewarding the environment, and it's great to see that we're working together and saying, you know what, let's issue a joint declaration, uh, protect the environment, pray for the environment, um, celebrate a national day of prayer for the environment on September 1st, which is yesterday. And, you know, a lot of people say, you know, well, Romans uh, anathematize Byzantine Greco-Slavs, and Byzantine Greco-Slavs anathematize Romans. The Greco-Slavs are, are really busy anathematizing each other lately. Um, <laughs> Jerusalem and Antioch have not been in good standing a lot with one another the past couple of years, and I think we should uh, tell our listeners to pray for them, too. Pray for them. So our topic today uh, is going to be the biblical case for Petrine primacy. Petrine primacy. Peter is where we get the word Petrine from, and primacy is, oh, tell us what that means, Brad. Well, primacy basically means that we believe as Catholics that Jesus gave the keys of the kingdom of heaven and the power to bind and loose to Peter. All the apostles had the power to bind and loose, but you have to understand that the image of the keys 
comes from Isaiah chapter 22. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the son of David. He's the messianic Davidic king. And just like in Isaiah 22 and throughout the centuries in the house of Israel, the house of David, there was a prime minister or you could say a grand vizier, mm -hmm. a royal steward that, that could either allow into the king's presence. He could, he could open and shut. He could bind and loose uh, with jurisdictional matters in the absence of the king. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a cabinet of ministers, just like maybe the president of the United States has a cabinet as well. Mm -hmm. But there's also um, what who you could might call... You can't do everything on your own. Exactly. Like the, the president has a vice president who's who is a lot of times overseeing the cabinet while the president is off doing other business. And in the Davidic kingdom, they had a prime minister. We believe the Pope fulfills that role in the kingdom of Jesus. In the new covenant kingdom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's get into that. Let's talk about uh, Peter's primacy. Peter as the first Pope. We're going to go through the biblical evidence for that. And starting off, uh, right just, away, just, just, one, just to Just to make clear, we know that the Italian word Pope did not exist in the first century. But we believe that the, the nature of the office did. Sure, yeah, yeah. The, we're not going after the word here, but the idea, just like Trinity, the word is not found in the Bible. The idea is we're going to look into that with the Pope. So let's get into it. Uh, number one, he is listed as number one in every list of the apostles. And by the way, Judas is always listed last. Yeah, so not, not, to, not to say that the further they go down, they're like somehow worse and worse. But the fact that Judas is always mentioned last indicates is, that he's... Not yeah. the leader. And they also say, <laughs> who betrayed him? Mm -hmm. There's huge spoiler alerts in all four Gospels. You know who's going to betray him from like chapter 2 or 3. <laughs> yeah, in fact, Matthew chapter 4 is the first time when we see a list of the apostles. This is when Jesus is going out, picking his disciples, who he's going to have. And the first thing in Matthew's Gospel it says is he saw Andrew and Peter, uh, sorry, Peter and Andrew out in their boat fishing listing Peter first, then it goes on James and John, uh, Philip Bartholomew, and he, he picks out the other ones as well. But Peter is the one who's named first. So uh, I think that's going to be interesting as we get into some more examples. Matthew chapter 10 verse 2 lists the names of all the apostles. First thing it says is, and it even uses the word, first Simon, who was called Peter, then Andrew, his brother, and so forth, all the way down to the And even the first time Judas. that it mentions that Andrew went and got Peter to bring him to Jesus, it mentions Andrew, but it mentions him like after Peter, even though okay. it's mentioning him finding Peter. It says, Andrew, now Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother? Yeah, that's in John's gospel, it introduces Andrew before it introduces Simon Peter, which is really interesting, especially in light of this first point we're making. But how does it introduce Andrew? John chapter 1, verse 40. One of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, we haven't met Simon Peter yet in John's gospel, but somehow he knew his audience would know, oh, that Simon Peter, we know who that is, right. and the, his brother. John the Beloved, or the scribe that maybe took down his preaching, the sacred author that is either John himself or someone who's relating his preaching uh, that he's dictating to. Mm -hmm. There is a tradition in the early church that John dictated his gospel to a scribe. Mm -hmm. um, but you you see there that he he's like, well, my audience who's reading this throughout throughout the church, scattered mm -hmm. in the dispersion of the church, they may not know who Andrew is, but they'll definitely know who Simon Peter is. Peter's the reference point to get who all the other apostles are. Right. And we don't know a lot about all the other apostles. You know, for example, the only thing we know about the other Simon among the apostles is that he was a zealot. Because he's called Simon the Zealot. Right. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why Jesus made one of his apostles a zealot, because he was trying to teach him that there's also a way of love, mm -hmm. that you do not have to take up arms necessarily every time. So this first point about Peter being named first, I, I bring it up because it happens a lot. It's not like one or two times in the Bible. It's in Matthew 4.18, Matthew 10.2, Mark 1.16, Mark 1.36, Mark 3.16, Mark 13.3, Luke 6.14, and Acts 1.13. These are all places where the apostles are listed. And in every single time, Peter's first. So there's something about that that says, you know, the other apostles, are they vary in their order. Uh, Philip might come before Bartholomew or uh, Andrew after John. But Peter's always first, and there's a reason for that in Scripture, and we're going to look into that, but it's one piece of evidence that there's something special about well, Peter. It's like, you know, Dan, it's like with, with my family, when people people say, uh, well, how many kids are in, how many siblings are in your family? 
I say Amanda, Andrea, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, I always start off with my oldest sister because she's the first sibling. Mm -hmm. In this sense, Peter's always listed first because he was the first brother. Yeah, he was the first, and it wasn't because he was the first one to know Jesus. Andrew's the one who introduced uh, F Peter to Jesus, but Peter was important for some other reason that made him the one to head out all these lists. Uh, okay, so number two, um, and this one's very similar, it doesn't prove by itself, but Peter is named more times than all of the other apostles combined. So that's uh, 155 times versus 130. For uh, That's all the other apostles combined. Like, and to think of it, that's including Paul. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the, the bulk of the New Testament was written by Paul, and even his name is mentioned far fewer times. Yeah, well, he, his name is listed at the beginning of each of his epistles. Uh, so that's like 13 times right there. And, and you, you add them all up, though. You add up uh, Andrew, Pete, Seth, or, sorry, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, uh, Paul, and the others, and you say all, all of these people who are very important, the other Simon, the, the good Judas, the bad Judas, these are all very important people in the Bible story, uh, they don't even come close to the level of importance that's attached to Peter with his name appearing, or one of his three names, Peter, Cephas, or Simon, all appearing together 155 combined times. So there's something about I mean, Peter. The New Testament is a book. Mm -hmm. It's or a collection of books, but the Bible, the New Testament is a document. It's like it's like reading a, a collective work, a book. Mm -hmm. It's it's like it's like when you read the Harry the Harry Potter novels, and Harry Potter's name obviously comes way first, so that would be the number of times Jesus' name would be mentioned in, mm -hmm. as as an analogy. But then like it's like Ron Weasley's like right behind him for some reason. Sure, Ron and Hermione are right up there. And uh, it's, it's kind of a similar role. Peter is Ron to Harry Potter's Peter, or, J or Jesus. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's a really good analogy. In an analogous way. Yeah. All right, so um, the, another reason why we talk about this, uh, I want to bring up Mark one thirty six because this is an indicator of how Peter's status was among the other apostles. Mark one thirty six says, uh, Simon and his companions went out to look for him, speaking of Jesus here. His companions here are all the other apostles. Simon, the other apostles are the companions of Peter. Peter is clearly the Peter one. Peter went out to look for him. Oh, by, by, by the way, the others were there too. Yeah, the other apostles <laughs> were there. So they're not of equal importance. There, there's fewer, there's more references to Peter and there's more importance attached to Peter in the Bible than all the others. And we'll get to that when we get to Paul's letters as well. Because he also does this. Okay, so uh, we're going to get into some more meaty stuff now uh, after we've gone through the names and the numbers and the, and the times that people are listed. Uh, we're going to get into some of the meat now, some of the passages that doctrinally teach us what Peter's role is. So what's an example of one of those? Well, right off the bat, uh, the classic Peter passage, uh, Matthew chapter 16. So I'm going to flip open here. We're going to take a look at what Matthew chapter 16 says about Peter. Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, this is Matthew 16, verse 17. Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the powers of death shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, verses 17 through 18. What do you think, Brad? Well, first of all, we have to see that the keys, again, d denote the house of David and him being sort of the grand vizier or the prime minister role. <laughs> and which also in Matthew 18, we'll see that, you know, the rest of the apostles have the authority to bind and loose as well. But we have to see that the person with the keys is the one that adjudicates disputes sure. between, uh, because if all the other brothers can't agree on whether they should bind and lose something. There has to be someone to adjudicate disputes on faith and morals. Sure. Uh, you can't have collegiality without the head of a college. I would say there's four main things in this passage that indicate Peter's headship. One of them is his name. This is where Jesus gives Peter the new name, Simon, I call you Peter. Uh, that's his new name. It means rock. That's a foundation word. In the northern Aramaic that Jesus spoke, it would have been uh, kepha. Yeah, kepha here is the Aramaic word for rock. In fact, that appears in John 1.42, where they put it and turn it into Greek literally as you know Cephas. That's what Jesus names him. I name you rock. That's a foundation word, and that indicates Peter's headship 
uh, just right there in his name. Second, and when you give someone a new name in scripture, you give them a mission. This is like when Moses was named Moses and his mother drew him out of the water. You know, that happens in scripture. People give a name and then they give the reason for the name. Uh, Adam called his wife Eve because she was taken out of man, out of man and it's like Ev and Eva right there in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Jesus was named Jesus, the angel says in Matthew chapter 1, because he shall save his people from their sins, saving being Yesha, and Jesus' name is Yeshua. So the name is related to the function here. The, the name gives, uh, there's a reason for it. And so mm -hmm. when Jesus gives Peter his new name, I call you Peter because on this rock I shall build my church. That's his mission. That's the reason for the name. It follows that biblical pattern. And we should we should make a, a mention here that when we talk about headship, we mean visible head of the church on earth. Sure. We, we don't mean absolute supreme universal throughout the cosmos. We're not trying to have Peter usurp the headship of Jesus. Sure. But yeah. Jesus, being, being the king of kings, can set up a prime minister, a royal steward role. He can role. do what he wants. Yeah, yeah. He, he can set up other shepherds, and he did. He set up the apostles as, as other shepherds to shepherd, help shepherd his flock. Yeah. But, um, but, um, and he gave some of them special roles, including one of them had uh, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So here's a third thing that's in this passage. The keys of the kingdom of heaven, they're a symbol for authority. Uh, like if I give you the keys to my house, I'm going on vacation here, here are the keys to my house. I'm giving you charge of my house, and if something if something happens here, you're responsible for making sure it's safe. It's, it's another way of, you, of saying, you know, what's mine is yours. Yeah, th that, that too. So he gives him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He gives him the authority of the kingdom of heaven behind his decisions. That's one huge reason why we think that makes Peter uh, a, a leader, the leader of the apostles. And all, then finally, the fourth reason, um, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is God backing Peter's decisions. Yeah, well, we should, we should also realize that binding and loosing would have been very familiar rabbinic theology for first century Jews. And they would have seen the authority behind the, the terms binding and loosing. Yeah, we can see that as just one example. Uh, in Isaiah chapter 22, where uh, it, where Shebna is set up as the prime minister of the house of Israel, uh, Luke chapter, or not Luke, Isaiah chapter 22, the kingdom of David is here, and he gives uh, Shebna the authority to, uh, he gives him authority to his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to the house of Judah, this is Isaiah twenty two twenty one, and I will place on his shoulder the key of the house of David. He shall open, and none shall shut. He shall shut, and none shall open. I will fasten him like a peg in a sure place, and he will become a throne of honor to his father's house. This is one of the passages that Jesus is evoking with his binding and loosing language, where it is clearly, this is the prime minister of the kingdom. This is the guy who has authority and has successors to take up that key after it's passed this down. This was one apologetic that the counter-reformation theologians would use when debating Lutherans and Calvinists in the 16th century. Jesus was because very many, Jewish, and because, he loved to cite the Old Testament. Right, because many people did not know about Isaiah 22. So there's lots of reasons within Matthew 16 of that passage there from verses 17 to 18 why uh, Peter is indicated here as uh, head of the church that Jesus announces he's going to build. Um, moving on from there, there's many other passages to get into as well. Uh, one of them that I like to go into, and this one's uh, less common uh, among apologetics literature, is Luke chapter 12. So let me flip open here to Luke chapter 12. Uh, we'll get into this. This is less focused on, but Luke chapter 12, verses 39 to 41. Jesus says, But know this, that if the householder had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would have been awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise steward, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? What do you think of that, Brad? I mean, Peter's asking what it means, and Jesus is like, You're supposed wink, to know wink, this. nod, nod. <laughs> yeah, you're supposed to know this. Uh, who am I supposed to set over my household? It's pretty explicit here. The steward, the steward who I'm supposed to set over my household to give their portion of food at the proper time. 
This is uh, a very analogous role to the role of the Pope. He is the chief steward, and he's supposed to give us our spiritual food, the Word of God, mm-hmm. at the you know at, every day. I also I also want to um, make a point real quick. Just a side note: a lot of times Protestants will use the term head pastor, mm-hmm. and they have no but, problem. But we can't have one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They 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 you're, they they're they, they, usurping they, the role of Jesus, who's supposed to be our chief <laughs> exactly. role. Exactly. But you're doing that too. Well, it's okay when we do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's 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 almost like when they say, "Well, why do you call your priest father?" And then they go around calling, "Well, this guy's my spiritual father." And yeah, you yeah. know, they, it's like if you put spirit- you're not supposed to have titles, right, Reverend? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> yeah. I, they, they they do this. Uh, sometimes you'll find people who uh, make these kinds of claims, and they they haven't researched and even thought about those Catholics don't themselves. know their Bible, do they, Bishop Miller? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, we're not supposed to have titles. So, so that that because Jesus says that you shouldn't be called father, doctor, teacher, or or you know, Lord. But he, but they he, say but but they call their Sunday school teachers Bible teachers. They call them teachers. They have their doctors who they go to. They they have their uh, and they and they give them titles. They call their dad father, even though it says you're not supposed to call anyone father on earth. But it, you know, it's okay when we do it. <laughs> yeah, just you Catholics. Uh, so there's Luke chapter twelve where Peter or Jesus is explicit that there's going to be a chief steward. Uh, set over his household, and that Peter's supposed to be it, I think that's really good evidence. That's not the only thing Luke has to offer for us, though. Uh, Luke chapter 22 is one of the most explicit passages about Peter's role, where Jesus is talking to the apostles in Luke 22, 31. It says, Simon, Simon, behold, <clears throat> Satan demanded to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you yourself, that your own faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brethren. This is really critical here. Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you all, plural here. He's talking to all the apostles, that he may sift you all like wheat. The Bible I'm looking at, Revised Standard Version, Catholic Edition, has got the little you know, footnotes here where it says that you know, the Greek word for, for you here is plural. But then in verse 32, I have prayed for you yourself. It goes to singular again. I have prayed for you yourself, that when you yourself have turned again, strengthen your brethren. The, the, all the apostles are in danger. Satan demanded to have them all, that he may sift them all. But Jesus prays for Peter, that his faith may not fail. And this reminds me of like if, uh, when, the, when the plant is, going, is in danger of, uh, of dying, you water the root. When the tribe is in danger of being attacked, you tell the chief. You go to the person who's in charge, to, and then he can help all the rest. Peter's role here is to strengthen his brethren when they're all in danger, and it's it's very explicit. One, that some translations, he has a role there. one translations say this is the passage where Jesus is prophesying his denials, mm-hmm. and he's in some translations it'll say once you are converted, confirm your brethren. Mm-hmm. Confirm, so Jesus yeah. foretells that he he will fall into some sin, but that he will convert, mm-hmm. and he will he will be be the one to confirm the brethren. And confir- confirming someone is a very su- supporting, uh, it's a very, what's the word, foundational role. It's the upholding role, the st- supporting role, the strengthening role, the, the one that says, you know, you're like, the, you're like the pillar that the others are resting upon. You're the, mm-hmm. you're the firm support for them all. So uh, that Peter's role there is very foundational, according to the words of Jesus, when he, when he gives them this mission of all, you are all in danger, you're the one who has to... Uh, you know, fix things. Yeah, and I have prayed for you that your faith mm-hmm. will not fail. So, th- yeah, that it's super important right there. Uh, so we've been through Matthew, we've been through Luke. Uh, let's also check out what the Gospel of John has to say about Peter's role. John chapter 21, uh, verses 15 through 17. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. And then he does it again a third time. What what do you think about this passage, Brad? Well, in the Greek, the word tend is also another it's a, it's a it's in the Greek root, it it it, it is it denotes shepherding, ruling. Mm-hmm. Overseeing, and actually, the word bishop that you encounter later on in the New Testament is episkopos or episkopoi, which mm-hmm. means to be an overseer. 
And and if we notice, it's the same he, word that Jesus that it calls Jesus in the book of Revelation. He shall rule all the nations with a rod of iron. That word, he will rule all the nations. Is the same word that's used here when it says Peter's going to tend rule the sheep. The Greek word's the same. Yeah, and also it's the exact same word when he says. Um, the, this shepherding role is the same one that Jesus prophesied in John chapter 10. It when is. He, when he said there will be one flock and one shepherd. Yeah, and, and there is a role for Peter there to be the pe person in, the, in charge of this flock. I think it's really interesting here. The, who, who's in the flock of Christ? There's the sheep and there's the lambs. It, there's the sheep who are the older people in the in the flock of Christ, people who've been Christians for a while, and there's the lambs who are the younger people, the new Christians, the the converts, and the and Peter's given charge of feeding the sheep, the el yeah. the older ones in Christ right. who've been a Christian for a long time, and tending the lambs, the the ones who are newer. In and, Christ. Je and Jesus said, uh, uh, "Who whose sheep? His sheep. Yeah. Whose lambs? His lambs. That includes everybody. It is. Yeah. The the lambs and the sheep. There's no one else in the flock." That's it. That's it. <laughs> right. Uh, so if you're in the flock of Christ, then you have someone who's supposed to be in charge of you, who's supposed to feed you and tend you and rule in this in this sheepfold. Jesus tells us this in his gospel when he's teaching about how his flock, how his church is going to be governed. He gives it a shepherd. And actually, the the word pastor mm -hmm. comes from a German word that means shepherd. It does, yeah. In, in even the English word, you so, sometimes talk about. So when Protestants are calling, the, when Protestants field. are calling their their ministers, when they say the head pastor, they're saying the head shepherd. Yeah, the, and that's all. That's what, again. that's what we're saying about the Pope. So we got Matthew, we got Luke, we got John. The Synoptic Gospels and the Gospel of John are pretty clear about Peter's role and about him being the chief overseer of the flock of Christ and being the being the one in charge of the other apostles and being the leader of the apostles and that this is supposed to continue as the way Christ's church is governed that he gives them a key that can be handed down to other I mean not a physical key it's an analogy but but it's uh, something that is the in, in, analogously able to be handed down because it's like a physical right. object and this is supposed to be something that continues in his church. Some some Protestants uh, and even some Orthodox might object to the fact that we say that the papacy is, in, in certain senses, the foundation of the Catholic Church or mm -hmm. you know the foundation of unity. And they say, well, Christ is the cornerstone. Well, it's it's all throughout the epistles of the New Testament where in a lot of places, in Revelation, it says that the new Jerusalem is built on 12 foundations which are inscribed with the names of the 12 apostles, mm -hmm. um, Matthias's name being in place of Judas. Ephesians chapter 2 says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. And the prophets. And the prophets. There, so, I know, mean, Jesus, the people will say, you know, well, Jesus is the cornerstone. There can be no other part of the foundation. Have you ever foundationed, dude? There's, yeah, exactly. There's more I mean, to a foundation. I mean, than if one you just stone. put a cornerstone, you, you don't have a whole foundation. Right. You have one and, thing. So. And actually, I forget which Petrine epistle it is, but it's either First or Second Peter, where he says that we are all stones being built mm -hmm. up, continually built up into the temple, the household of God. Yeah. Peter's, Peter's quite explicit. There is more than more foundation than only Jesus being being as part of the the cornerstone of the church. He absolutely is. There's other stuff too. Jesus didn't want to just have this be a do-it-yourself religion. He wanted to have something with leadership, with bishops, with priests, with pastors, with with uh, deacons, so people in charge of various things in the household of God. And he says he has a faithful and wise steward who he sets over his household, and he names Peter as as he's it. So, and gives him a key that can be passed down, a spiritual key, not a physical key, that he can pass down to his successors, and that's still going. Only, you know, Protestant churches, they don't have that. You know, you sometimes hear the argument, well, this is something that the apostles were supposed to have, but once the apostolic age ended, we don't need that anymore. Yeah, you, you see, sometimes they say that when it comes to, like, anointing with oil, uh, forgiving mm -hmm. and retaining sins. There's all these extraordinary powers mm -hmm. that Jesus gave to his church. Oh, but it was only meant for the first generation. Yeah, we don't need that anymore. You know, when we're going under persecution and when we're going through uh, the, these very difficult times, uh, we, we don't need those things. That's just... The apostles needed them because you know they were the closest ones to Jesus, and uh, they you know they had it easy. Actually, the the whole cessation. I'm not, I'm not saying that. Yeah, I know. But the whole cessationist argument that that miracles were the the cessation argument that miracles are no longer needed 
didn't even come up anywhere in church history until the Protestant Reformation because mm-hmm. there was all these schisms happening all over the Christian world. But like next to maybe some, but next to no miracles were happening anymore in these Protestant schisms. Mm-hmm. And, and they saw all these miracles happening in the Catholic Church and they're like, well, there must be some theological reason why we don't have miracles anymore. It's really hard to say miracles have ceased in Christian history when they're going on all around you. So, you know, when you break off a section and say, well, oh, clearly miracles have ceased. They're not happening in our communities. It's like, well, yeah, there's a reason for that. <laughs> yeah. A, uh, yeah, there's the c- cessation argument is applied to miracles. It's also applied to gifts like uh, papal infallibility or the, the fact that the church had a strong leader, a steward to begin with. People will say, oh, well, that's just under the apostles. Yeah, clearly Peter was the leader. We don't need one anymore. Then why is it a, why is it an office a succession with the analogy of a key given for how it's able to be passed down in a, in a steward position that has successors in and it? And as a matter like of fact, we'll be talking more about that history in our next segment. Yeah, we're going to have another segment next week uh, called the historical case for Petrine primacy. Uh, and so tune in the, again if you want to hear more about the, the historical history. case, meaning the post biblical case. Right, right. As if the, we can give a Bible case, we give a historical case. The Bible doesn't count as historical, though. Yet. No. Well, I mean, is, I mean, I mean, clearly they're both historical, but um, we're we're going to basically we're going to maybe we could call next week like the Bible continues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. After Acts. <laughs> yeah. But speaking of Acts, though, we need to get into Acts of the Apostles because there's more in here. Uh, after the Gospels, you could you would only get to see the setup for the church. You get to see the church in action. You'd only get to see Peter promise he's going to be the head of the church. You get to see Peter as head of the church and what that looks like. So uh, let's get let's go through some examples here. Uh, Acts chapter two. Peter's the one to give the speech at Pentecost. So here here I am in Acts chapter two. Uh, Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem. It's a lot of people. Uh, let this be known to you, give ear to my words. And he, and he gives a speech about being converted and coming into Christianity. Well, why is it that Peter is the one, you know, why didn't Bartholomew step up and say, you know, I've, I've got a speech to give to you all. Why is it that Peter is the one who stands up with the eleven and gives a speech? You think it might have something to do with him? Hmm, I don't know, maybe, maybe Peter's the leader here. It's, maybe yeah. he's the spokesman. Right. Well, especially because, uh, you know, starting early on in the book of Acts, Jesus had appeared to James, mm-hmm. who was the brother of the Lord. So he was obviously either A, one of his kinsmen, or B, he was called brother of the Lord because he was in some sense very close to him and he knew him very well mm-hmm. in some sort of intimate way. You, sure. you, but, but James doesn't say, oh, well, I'm a, I'm, you know, I'm a cousin or I'm a relative of Jesus. So let you me know. give the speech. Yeah. You know, he, he, everyone defers. Peter's t- it's Peter's time to speak. And it's not, it's not like Peter was the best spokesman either. He often said things that were really dumb. Yeah, it's, it's, to it's him. you know, it's, 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 it's almost like uh, that speech in the Lego movie. I know what you're thinking. I am by far the least qualified person to lead us. <laughs> but then, and you'd be right. <laughs> but God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called and he equipped Peter to give this speech. Okay, let's keep going. There's more in Acts of the Apostles about this. So uh, in the Acts of the Apostles, you get into chapter 3. Peter starts doing miracles. Uh, he heals a man. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John were going up to the temple. A man lame from birth was being carried there, and Peter you know, heals him, and the guy gets up and starts walking and enters the temple. Uh, th- this is a, this is the, I believe this is the first miracle that happens in Acts of the Apostles, other than the Apostles all being given tongues, and Peter's the one who does it. So to me, this calls to mind you know, Elijah and Elisha. Uh, Elijah had Elisha as his protege. He was training him. And Elijah had other people who were you know, really enthralled with his ability to teach and prophesy and do miracles. Uh, Elijah had other people who, who he thought of as um, you know, important people in his circle. But Elisha was there. He followed him. And when Elijah uh, goes up into heaven in a, a chariot of fire... Uh, Elisha goes back and starts doing the miracles and starts having the spirit of Elijah upon him. And everyone's, oh, well, that's that's Elijah's successor. So here in the Acts of the Apostles, it starts out, Jesus, he goes up to heaven in, the, in a cloud, and uh, Peter starts doing miracles. Peter starts preaching. C- clearly, there's successorship here, and Peter has a role that the other apostles don't have. Because Peter's the one who's everyone's pointing to and say, oh, well, this guy's the one. This, if we want to talk to the apostles, we're going to go talk to Peter. 
I, at least I think it's very clear if you use analogies from other parts of Scripture that Peter has some kind of successor role where uh, Jesus is in charge of his church, then Jesus goes into heaven and he designates Peter as his, as the one who's going to be in charge of his church now. And that's what we see Peter doing here in the Acts of the Apostles with the preaching, with the miracles, with the other stuff that Jesus does, Peter takes over. Does that, does that make sense? Or well, it's, it's, on it's, it's one of the reasons why we can truly say that Jesus did not leave his church orphaned mm -hmm. because he, he set up Peter as, as a primary shepherd and the other apostles as other overseers and shepherds gathered around this, this unity. There was a, a college of the, the apostles who were the first bishops. And if you read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, mm -hmm. Titus, if you read First and Second Peter, it's all over Acts that they, they, had, they had a successor for Judas. Even for the traitor Judas, they still mm -hmm. appointed a successor for him because the bishopric still needed to be filled. Then, and, and, you know, Paul went founding yeah. these churches and he would set up bishops and, 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 and people. He Titus, would set up Timothy, bishops and elders. Are, uh -huh. and, and, and by the way, elder is presbuteroi or pres, presbuteris, which can be translated priest just as easily as it can be translated elder. Right, right. And it, it's because these people were in charge of things. Like, to, Peter, uh, Paul is pretty explicit. I gave to Timothy all my authority, and now to use this authority and don't let anyone contradict you. Uh, that's in uh, say the first or second Timothy, chapter two. Uh, P Timothy was given the authority that Paul had so that he could use it in this area. Jesus does this with Peter, and just like the other apostles, when they died, they needed someone to succeed them. Acts chapter one. Uh, this also happens with Peter. When he dies, somebody needs to he needs to take up the take and, up Peter's and keys he, after he's here's gone. the thing for us to be Bible based Christians. And I I was raised Protestant, so that I know that's a the biggest thing in Protestantism is the phrase being a Bible based Christian. Mm -hmm. So historically, the first century, Jesus promised Peter and the apostles. And actually, when he says, "I I have prayed for thee." that your faith will not fail. The actual better translation is like a you all. Mm -hmm. I have prayed for you all that your, as in all of your faith, that your faith will not fail. So if we believe that, that there was some great apostasy in the third century or fourth or fifth century or you know the 10th century or what have you from, from the true faith that the, that the vast majority of the church just fell into error, mm -hmm. then the gates of hell prevailed against his church, and Jesus that makes Jesus into a liar. Right, right. So either Jesus is telling us the truth, and the successors of the apostles, the bishops of the Catholic church, and especially the successor of Peter, either their faith didn't fail, and Jesus kept his promise, or their faith did fail, and it makes our Lord into a liar. Right. Yeah, you have to choose. Either you follow your Bible or you follow the view that Jesus was not a liar and his church does have successors for important people like Peter, uh, who had the foundational stewardship role among the apostles. Okay, I got a, few, a lot more to get through in the Acts of the Apostles about Peter's role. Uh, some of this we're going to go through pretty quickly. Um, after We're in Acts chapter 3 right now where he does the first miracle of you know, healing a man. Uh, a couple of verses later, Peter addresses the multitudes of Israel, men of Israel. Here's, here's another speech he gives. And then in Acts chapter 4, Peter speaks to the Sanhedrin. And in fact, at the beginning of his speech, he says, Rulers of the people and elders, here's my message to you guys. And that, that's in Acts chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, verse, Acts chapter 4, verse 8. So uh, Peter speaking to the uh, Sanhedrin, uh, who he explicitly identifies as rulers of the people. He speaks to all the people of Israel. We not only see that he's acting as spokesman for the, all the apostles, but he's also acting as leader here. Because uh, if you're going to have uh, someone who's going to go speak to the leaders of another group, you want to send your leader, if you can, to talk to them. Not to mention, you have a chief. You have all the chief priests of the nation of Israel and the mm -hmm. scribes who who had the authority of binding and loosing in the old covenant. And Peter's basically standing up to them and say, "Well, that authority is with me now." Like right. Yeah, right. yeah. P Peter has a lot of evidence behind him that he's supposed to be in charge of the apostles because he acts like it. Okay, another one. This one's this one's pretty critical. I'm actually going to read read some out of this one. Acts chapter five, uh, verse uh, starts with verse one. 
So uh, a man named Ananias, with his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property, and with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of the proceeds and brought only a part and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is a pausing for a second from the scripture here. This is a really great example of how the early church worked, and it shows that it had hierarchy and leadership here. They didn't just bring it and lay it down at anyone's feet and say, oh yeah, you're, you're going to designate you as our mm-hmm. pastor for the day. The apostles were in charge. Okay, so he lays it down at the apostles' feet. Verse 3, but Peter said, <laughs> okay, right here, so right off, uh, Peter's the one who's speaking for all the apostles. He's having things laid down right there. Uh, in front of all of them. In front of all of them. Peter said, quoting the Bible again, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back part of the proceeds of the land? Okay, so this is, this is pretty key. Side note, he's reading souls, which is a miracle that some, which is a gift that some priests still have to this day in the Catholic yeah, Church. How did he know? How did he know that Ananias lied about this and said, oh, I'm going to give all the proceeds, but then he doesn't? How did he know that? Mm-hmm. It doesn't say that Ananias told the apostles, I'm going to give all my proceeds to your you know, to your stuff. It says he withheld some of it. But Peter knew that he had made this promise, maybe to him, maybe to someone else, and that he wasn't keeping it. Yeah, he's like he's like Padre Peter Pio. <laughs> Padre Peter Pio Peter. <laughs> but he knows, and he, and he knows that it's a lie to the Holy Spirit. It's not just a lie to men. You didn't just lie to us and promise us. You promised the Holy Spirit in your heart that you would do this. And you know, that's what, even what he says. He, Satan has filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. This is a private thing that this guy uh, made, a private promise. And Peter sees it and he says, uh, well, while it remained unsold, did it, did it not remain your own? Mm-hmm. You, know, you didn't have to do this. You didn't have to make this promise. After it was sold, was it not at your disposal? How is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. He's explicit here. This is a private thing that this guy made. He's reading his soul. So Peter's acting as judge here. Among the other apostles, Peter steps forward. He's got things laid down at his feet. It's very leadership sounding. Uh, then Ananias heard these words. He fell down and died. So a couple, uh, not long after that, an interval about three hours, it says in verse 7, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. Notice this, he's interrogating now. This is a very judicial role here that Peter's uh, acting in among the other apostles. We should note, too, that he keeps saying, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? Mm-hmm. Why did you lie to God? It's so, as if as, he speaks for God. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, like lying to the apostles is lying to the Holy Spirit. You have not lied to men, but to God. Okay, so she says, yes, for so much. She, that's how much she sold, sold the, um, the, the land for. It doesn't tell us what it was, but it was so much. So Peter said to her, this is verse 9, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Hark, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and died. Okay, so Peter here has a clear, a very scary role in leading the whole Christian community and in taking responsibility for even even things that are of mortal danger to people. Peter is uh, really a very serious force to be reckoned with in the early church. All the apostles are standing around watching this happen, and Peter's there in the midst with things getting laid down at his feet. He's uh, t- people dying at his feet. He's, he's commanding. He's inquisiting. You know, he is uh, he's being a pope. It's, it's what he's doing. Okay, so moving on from Acts chapter 5, where Peter acts as judge and indicates his roll as head there. Acts chapter 5, still in chapter 5, verse 15. More miracles. You know, people are lining up. Uh, it says in verse uh, 15. Lining up here, the streets with their sick and diseased. So that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and pallets that so as that, Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall. Yeah, so that so much, of his, so much as his shadow. People fall lining up to have Peter's oh, shadow. Well, oh, by the way, who's a figure that people usually line up in the streets for so their babies can get blessed and their sick and diseased can, can get, be yeah. healed and so much as the, the person's shadow can fall upon them and who, who's looking for... for it's spe- very reminiscent and, and, of scenes from and, the gospel. And who's looking for spiritual comfort. And it's not only rep- reminiscent of Jesus, 
But uh, that figure's still here today. Yeah, there's the Pope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there, he's right there in Rome, and people still do this. They line up and they hope that Pope's shadow might fall on them, or that they might get a relic, or that their baby might get kissed by him, or that someone might get healed. Because you know, Pope sometimes. And, are and by the way, gift. anybody could research into several miracles that have happened because Pope Francis has prayed for babies or prayed mm -hmm. for a diseased person. Many miracles have happened even under the pontificate of Francis. Right. So it happens. It's something that I mean, this isn't a gift that. That is permanently given as the gift to you know do miracles for people. Some popes have it and some don't. But it starts in the Bible that people treated him as if he was a leader, and they did things like lining up behind him to have his shadow fall on them. It's very it's reminiscent of things that happened in the Gospels. It's reminiscent of things that happened today with the Pope. Uh, it's it's very indicative that Peter was the leader of this spiritual community. It doesn't say people were lining up to have you know Philip's shadow fall on them. They weren't lining up outside of Philip's doors, but they were doing, at least not from what we know, but they were doing it for Peter. And it was important enough that Luke, writing this, is like, i got to note this down. Someone was in charge of this thing. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter speaks for the Sanhedrin again. We don't need to go into a lot of this. It's A lot of it's similar. Acts chapter 8, verse 14 through 24. Uh, Peter visits the Sumerians. Okay, so this one's a, a key one. People will bring this up. Half-breeds. <laughs> People bring this up and say, you know, the people of Samaria, you know, the, Peter was not the one who converted them. That's my pop, by the way. Sorry, folks. It was it was Philip who converted the Samarians. Peter wasn't in charge. He didn't convert the Samarians. Oh, you're, you're right that Peter didn't go convert the Samarians, and that was Philip. In Acts chapter 8, Philip goes and converts the Samarians. Then he goes back and he says, guys, the Samarians have received the gospel. I just, I just left them. And... Peter's like, I have to go see this. So, so he takes John along, and they go to visit the Samarians, and he talks to them. He says, have you received the gospel? Yeah. Have you been baptized? Yeah. And he starts confirming them. He lays his hands on them so that they can be confirmed in the Holy Spirit. Peter's the one who visits you know, with John. He brings John along with him, and they start uh, fulfilling what F Philip had begun. This is another indicator that Peter's in charge here. Uh, some, someone begins a work, and Peter comes along to finish it. He also meets Simon you the Magician. You could say he's confirming it. You could say he's confirming his brethren. <laughs> uh, at, and he also meets Simon the Magician here, and he you know, uh, warns him that if he continues doing bad things, uh, his money will perish with him. He tries to buy you know, the, uh, the Doesn't gift he try to of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't he try to buy apostleship, basically? Something like that. It doesn't say apostleship, but it, it looks like that to me. He's, he wants to be able to confirm people and have the Holy Spirit fall on them and speak in tongues like Peter's doing. Uh, and With a little says, bit of the occult on the side. Yeah, Simon the Magician ends up being a bad guy. But, you know, he starts out as a bad guy too. Okay, so Acts chapter 9. Um, this is one that's a, a lot of times not focused on in apologetics literature. And I think it's kind of, I think it's neat. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. The church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria. Pause for a second. I'll stop reading the Bible. That's like the extent it had spread to so far was these Jewish areas. Um... Uh, Galilee, Samaria, Judea, back to the Bible, had peace and was built up, and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it was multiplied. Now, as Peter went here and there among them all, he came down also to the saints that lived at Lydda. Lydda, it's L-Y-D-D-A, um, end quote. So, right here, Peter's visiting all the churches. He's, he's going around and he's seeing, making sure everything's, you know, ship shape. This is very leadership-like. The Pope still does this. He makes apostolic visitations to America, to you know, Greece, to other places where Catholicism has big churches. And he sees how things are going there. But it starts with Peter in the Bible. It doesn't mention any of the other apostles doing this. Peter's the one who goes around to all the... As it says, uh, went here and there among them all. That's a lot. you know, And he makes sure everything's in good shape. So, you know, he's exercising an oversight role here, but similar to maybe you might call it confirming his brethren, yeah. like what Jesus said he was supposed to do. You might call it, as Isaiah 22 said, being a father to Israel. Yeah, it's being said as well, a pagan. And, and actually, in, in uh, I think it's Galatians uh, chapter 3, but somewhere in the book of Galatians, St. Paul says that the church is the Israel of God. Mm -hmm. And throughout church history, um, basically until the rise of Calvinism, I think, uh, everywhere, uh, Christians everywhere called the church the new Israel. And, it, and it's so true. Isaiah chapter 22 prophesied that there would be someone who would have a key, who would have authority to open and no one shut, 
and who would be a father to his people and a peg of security for the house of Israel. Well, prophecy fulfilled. It's yeah. happened. Uh, okay, so Acts chapter 10, another thing that Peter's unique for. He is chosen to reveal uh, that Gentiles can be Christian too. So this happened, this is after Samaria and after some uh, the Ethiopian eunuch who was like a convert to Israel, who had been converted. Uh, a bunch of Gentiles converted too. And Peter's chosen to reveal that this is okay. See, God appears to him in Acts chapter 10, verse 27. And, uh, and Peter says, as he talked with uh, Cornelius, he went in and found other persons gathered. He said, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit any one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And he reveals that they can be Christian too. This is, and the P Peter gets asked about this by the other apostles in chapter eleven, the uh, chapter eleven, verse one. The apostles and the brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, and he tells them, "God appeared to me and revealed this to me, and we're supposed to do this now. We're supposed to let everybody in." The people will bring up that you know Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles, and they'll say you know, he had a bigger, wider audience than Peter because Peter was the apostle to the Jews. But for some reason, even though Peter ended up being a martyr in Rome, yeah, so he had a pretty wide audience. But for some reason, God picked the apostle of the Gentiles, specifically Peter, or I'm sorry, the apostle of the Jews, specifically Peter, and He said, "You're going to have to reveal this to everyone. That the doors open wide for anyone to come in." Now, Peter's got, get a, gets a huge role here uh, that's indicative of his special relationship with God. That he's got some kind of uh, some kind of earmark to say this guy's right. going to be the one to and, reveal this message. And actually, the Catholic Church has been more zealous throughout its history of evangelizing all the nations and showing no favoritism or partial partiality to race than literally any other church. I mean, the Catholic Church is present in literally, literally every single country on the planet. Yeah, and, and it's just like what Scripture said, all nations, go with ye therefore and make disciples of all nations. Prophecy full, well, it's a that's a command, but it's also indicative of what was going to happen, and it's happened. So uh, we, we're doing what Christ commanded. Uh, Acts chapter 15, this all comes to a head. This whole Gentiles can come into the church thing. A lot of people weren't okay with it. Acts chapter 15, there's a big council where they have, where they have debating, uh, and, they, and they go up to Jerusalem. This is in verse 3 of Acts chapter 15, verse 2. Uh, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, uh, pause, the people who didn't want the Gentiles to come in, Back to the Bible now. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. Awesome. Okay, we're going to get a debate here. All right. They, they debate. Chapter, verse 7, it says, uh, And after there had been much debate, Peter arose and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the early days God made choice among you that by my mouth the nations should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And then he gives a decision that the you know the the uh, they can let the Gentiles in, so uh, that's a big reveal right there. Like it's a reminder, it's hearkening back to the Gospels. God made a choice among you. It it was me. Yeah. God made a choice, and that someone was going to be the one to preach this message to all the nations, to preach His gospel to all the and, nations. And when Peter says his peace, I'm pretty sure the the scripture also says, and like they, everyone kept their peace, or everyone fell silent. Verse twelve, and all the assembly kept silence. There was debate. Peter speaks. All the assembly kept silence from there on out. It wasn't like they, okay, he's done speaking now. Let's have a rousing debate again. Yeah. <laughs> they kept silence after that. It was like, okay, we're done. It's been, it's, it's finished. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related, you know, the similar thing. God had done work among the Gentiles. And it, and it moves on. The council decides this is going to be the decision. The Gentiles can come in too. So that's Acts of the Apostles. That's almost the last time Peter appears in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, it mentions later that he went away and uh, wasn't seen or heard from for a while. Um, but that's about it. So then, what, what else we got? Uh, after um, the Acts of the Apostles is done, we got the rest of the New Testament to get through. And we have Peter's epistles. So Peter also wrote stuff. You know, he didn't just speak and give sermons and, and make decisions and have people die at his feet in the Acts of the Apostles. He also wrote some stuff, wrote part of the Bible. Uh, and his first letter of Peter is written to a lot more places than anyone else in the Bible writes to. This is verse 1 of 1 Peter, chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. If you get out a map, that's like everywhere in the Middle East. 
he's writing to a huge group of people who no one else who no one else wrote that much to. Like, that was the vast majority of the population of the church at that point. Yeah, it was like if it was like, all, all these different places. I mean, Galatia. Just take this one as an example. Paul wrote a letter to the Galatians, and Paul wrote a letter to uh, other groups. He wrote one to the Corinthians. To they, they were individual things, though. And it was usually one letter to each and it group. was usually individual cities, usually yeah. like one city, not not all these regions. Yeah, Paul Peter, when he writes, he goes to people over here and over here and over here, and on a map. It's like wow, that's everywhere. He's writing to a whole big group. The, the only other apostle who comes close to uh, the audience that Peter was in charge of is John in his book of Revelation. He has seven churches who he writes to all in one you know book. Uh, he and they're all in uh, Asia Minor. Um, just like what uh, Peter's writing to here, but th- if you look on a map, but Peter wrote to a whole lot more than even John did. He wrote to a lot more than seven cities. These are regions. And John most likely wrote Revelation after Peter was martyred. That's true. Yeah, but John apparently wrote it in like the 90s AD, and Peter was dead by then. Um, John acts like an archbishop who is over a certain region of the church. Peter acts like a pope who's in charge of the whole thing. And... This also shows up in 2 Peter, where he writes a letter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. So everyone. Uh, all Christians. All Christians, yeah. yeah. Uh, an epistle that goes to all the Christians. And, you know, and notice he doesn't, he doesn't go on to say, now, now there's all these criterion for equal faith. If you're someone that has assented and, and had the, the faith, mm-hmm. like the, the actual, like, you 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 are all, you have started your journey of faith. You're included in this letter. Yeah, you're one of the lambs. Yeah, as opposed to the sheep. But he's writing to them all, just like Jesus said, tend, "Feed my sheep with you know the the word of God, tend my lambs with with a rod of iron." This is what G- Peter is doing when he's writing to literally everyone in the church and exercising that leadership, which no one else does. The only other person that people bring up and say, you know, Peter's not the only one to write to a big group. James did too. James, you know, the letter of James. So let's look at that. Let's look and see what he wrote to. Verse 1, chapter 1 of James. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greeting. The twelve tribes. That's not, a, that's not everyone. It's the Jewish it's, diaspora. Yeah, this is the, the Jewish people, and, he, and he's talk, specifically it's Christians among them, because in chapter 2, verse 1, uh, you who hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. He's talking to fellow Christians who happen to be among the 12 tribes, the, the Jews, notice, Jewish Christians. Notice, these are Peter, James, well, not James the Apostle, but it's Peter, James, and John. And who are the three people that Paul wrote about saying that they were reputed to be pillars and who he had to get approbation from? Yeah, he, 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 he chapter 2, verse 9, there were certain apostles who he says were reputed to be pillars. There was leadership among the apostles. Some were more important than others. Pete, Paul recognizes that. Galatians 2.9, some were pillars. Uh, Gal- 2 Corinthians 11, there were super apostles. And uh, 2 Corinthians 12.11 talks about that as well. And Peter was among them. He was, he was one of these, he was one of the pillars, one of the super apostles, because he had the special role of confirming the whole brethren, which no one else had, uh, which shows up in Peter's letters. I thought the super apostles were a dissident group. I've never heard that before. Oh, anyway. I'll do some research. We'll get back to that next time. Uh, one more, a couple more things from Paul's letters, because uh, that's like all the rest of the Bible is either <laughs> we've been through the Acts and Gospels and the rest of the New. We've been through some of the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we got the Acts, Gospels, Paul's letters, yeah. and the other letters. So we just, just, just a every quick note: there. Paul is another person where people will say Paul had more primacy than Peter. Paul had to get the right hand of fellowship. From Peter, and he said the reason he went up to Jerusalem with confer to confer with Peter, James, and John, and to get the right hand of fellowship from well, Peter yeah. was so that he would not preach his gospel in vain. Yeah, read the Book of Galatians. It's a really great way to learn about Peter's role um, because Paul talks about it too. Uh, so another example from Paul's letters uh, in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse five: Can I not take along a sister with me, as does Peter and the apostles? Uh, Peter and the brothers of the Lord and the apostles. So you notice he separates Peter here from the other apostles as if there's something special. You know, there's something about Peter that he says the apostles are one group in his mind and Peter is another. It's, it's really very, you might say this about someone who's a leader. You might be like, yeah, uh, it's the leader of the group and the group yeah. went, went to, you know, Cedar Point. Or Trump and his cabinet went, you yeah. know. Yeah. Et, so et the apostles and like Mark said earlier, Peter and his companions, they're like his cabinet. 
Um, okay, so another one, Peter. So in an analogous Paul, way, in a weak analogy, right? According to Paul in his letters, Peter is a pillar of the church. Galatians two nine, a super apostle. If, assuming I'm right about that being a positive thing, which I, maybe I'm not. Uh, we'll look at that for next time. Uh, he is distinct from the other apostles. First Corinthians nine five. He also says that Jesus appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. First Corinthians fifteen five. Okay, so that's another indicator. Um, Jesus is uh, rising after after he's dead, and he appears first to Peter. That's a good mm-hmm. indicator that well, Peter's in charge. And here. there was a, a common refrain, almost like a, a tiny microcosm hymn throughout mm-hmm. the tradition of the early church, especially the first five or six centuries, mm-hmm. where Christians a lot of times wouldn't just say, Christ is risen, truly he is risen. Many times they would say, Christ is risen, and he has appeared to Simon. And there's an, another there's very, something about Simon. There's another very early tradition in the church, both east and west, that uh, an antiphon that says, "God is the Lord, and He revealed Himself to us. Blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord." There's something about the way Peter, Paul phrased this. He appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Like once again, there's distinct groups. Peter is uh, in Paul's mind. The twelve is a, is one group, and Peter's another because. At least I think it's because he recognizes that that they're like the cabinet to Peter's presidency, in a weak analogy. Uh, okay, one a couple things though. Peter's the pillar. He's a, he's a, distinct from the other apostles. Paul conferred with him for fifteen days after his conversion in Galatians one eighteen. That's a big deal. Like I'm going to convert. I got to go get the right hand mm-hmm. of fellowship. I'm going to go see Peter. Galatians one eighteen. He talks about that, and he's so much more important than James. Not that James is unimportant, but Peter's so much more important than him that he almost doesn't count James when he talks about what apostles he saw when he was in Jerusalem. Oh, yeah, by the way, James was there too. Yeah, yeah. Galatians 1.19, Paul, Paul's like, I went up to see the apostles, and all I saw was Peter for 15 days. Well, I also saw James. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like saying, I had an audience with Pope Francis. Oh, and by the way, I ran into Cardinal Sarah while I was in Rome too. Right, it clearly indicates who's most important here and that's what Paul does so there's evidence throughout the New Testament throughout even the Old Testament prophecy that they were going to have someone in charge of the church uh, that it's going to be Peter at, in the initial time and that he's going to have successors and and this this continues throughout down for 2,000 years of Christian history where whenever anybody wanted to missionize or evangelize a completely new region mm-hmm. or expand the territory of the church in a big way, confer with Peter. They had to confer with the papacy mm-hmm. to 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 be. I mean, even 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 it saints. It happened with England. It even, happened with uh, Methodius and Cyril. Yeah, 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 Cyril and Methodius, mm-hmm. which are highly venerated by the Russian Orthodox and and the Romanians of Bulgaria by the Slavic peoples. They're like, we want to go to Bulgaria. Go to Rome first. <laughs> yeah, uh, it well, happened they, with Patrick they, in Ireland. He they, went to Rome before he went to Ireland. Well, they 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 were first commissioned by Constantinople, but then Constantinople was like, oh well, make sure you get Rome's approval too. Yeah, yeah. So they, it was recognized that you, like Paul, you confer with Peter and you make sure that the message you're preaching lines up with uh, what you know what we're supposed to be preaching. So there is someone in charge of God's church. The Bible teaches this very clearly. And as we just started to get into, tune in for next time where we'll talk a little bit about the history, the historical case for Petrine Primacy here on Mid-Ohio Apologetics. Any final words, Brad? God is the Lord and he appeared to Simon. Amen. Have a wonderful day, everyone.